Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, special webinar. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is a webinar sponsored by the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. Our topic today is the significance, relevance, importance of faith-based organizations as they apply to addressing critical challenges of our time, the urgent crises. Of course, we're all in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. We have uh, really an all-star group of panelists joining us this morning. We're very happy that uh, from the office of the UN ODC, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes, Jean-Luc uh, Lemahieu, we have uh, Ambassador Alvaro Albacete, the Deputy Secretary General of Kaisid. We have Dr. Aza Karam, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. We have Ms. Saskia Shalikins, who is now coordinating the Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development. Uh, Bishop uh, Munib Yunan, who is uh, a retired uh, Lutheran bishop, former head of the Lutheran World Federation, and uh, an honorary president of Religions for Peace. Uh, Dr. Michael Plotzer and myself, Dr. Thomas Walsh, we are happy to co-chair the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. And uh, I'm going to invite Michael to join me now and just say a few words of welcome uh, from his venue in uh, uh, the Canary Islands, I believe it is. And uh, uh, if he is unmuted, I would give the floor to Michael to say a, say a little bit about the background of the coalition. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me now? Good. Yes, all right. Uh, as many know, I'm on a small desert island in the Atlantic. I've been here now uh, three months uh, on quarantine, uh, enjoying it and preparing for this. Um, I was 35 years in the UN, and the last station I had was in UNODC, and after that, I did some pastoral care work in the prisons which is how I came to this faith-based organizations and crime prevention. Um, as many of you will all already know, there are many ways in which uh, uh, religious people or people of faith are working towards um, peace, crime prevention. Um, some may not even know that they're doing such good works. Um, we have been trying now to get a more formal structure between the UNODC and the faith-based organizations. We have succeeded in this. We have uh, been hosted by UNODC a year ago at the um, UN in Vienna, and we've held a series of events in between in, uh, in Vienna, the cathedral, as well as in New York, uh, and in San Francisco at the uh, Christ Church Cathedral. Uh, we have developed a series of principles uh, which we think can apply to all faith-based organizations. And we hope that uh, we will be accepted and respected by the UNODC officials as valuable partners in, in justice. So I think I've said enough. Um, I think we all have, I'll have another chance to intervene, but it's been a blessed uh, journey, and I thank all those who on the screen um, who have helped in this uh, enterprise, and we look forward to expanding it to a further hundred or a thousand people by the end of this summer. Uh, we'll speak later about things we would intend to do in the in this summer. Every three weeks, have a similar webinar later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And uh, yeah, a lot of people have worked hard to prepare and build up the coalition. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Elmar Kuhn in Vienna, who's been active in developing uh, our Vienna base, and uh, Anna Alvazzi with the NGO Alliance, who's uh, kindly uh, welcomed us to uh, collaborate with them on this project. Without further ado, uh, ordinarily, Jean-Luc 
uh, LeMahieu would speak from UNODC. He's having a little technical difficulty, will join us hopefully momentarily. And therefore, without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce representing uh, Kaisid, the King Abdullah International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, Ambassador Alvaro Albacete. Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. Thank you, Dr. Plaza. And greetings to all, all the colleagues that are uh, in the panel today. Dear friends, I would like to begin by thank you, by thanking the UNODC and the leadership of Mr. Jean-Luc Lemayeux for the cooperation in the past month, which led to the organization of today's meeting, the first in a series of webinars on the role of FBOs and religious actors in crime prevention and justice. I'm pleased to take part in today's dialogue and to see our dear friend and long-standing partner, Dr. Atza Karam, joining us in this endeavor. Today's meeting, as it has been highlighted already, was organized as a follow-up to a series of meetings that took place in Vienna and San Francisco in 2019, which provided a platform for, for representatives of faith-based organizations to bring their voices to the policy table and complement the work of the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice as the principal policy-making body of the United Nations in the field of crime prevention and criminal justice. As an intergovernmental organization mandated to promote interreligious and intercultural dialogue and enhance the cooperation between policymakers and religious actors in order to promote peace and social cohesion with our headquarters in Vienna, Kaisit is thrilled to be partnering with the UNODC and the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations for Crime Prevention and Justice on this initiative. We hope that this meeting opens a new avenue for cooperation in the challenging times where we all are bound to work remotely facing the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to think about this new context as an enabling force rather than a disruptive one. Too often, religious and cultural differences are reduced to simplistic narratives of conflict. This assumption must be challenged through building and maintaining partnerships between policymakers and faith-based organizations. In a world where more than 80% of the population identifies itself as religious, the potential of religious leaders and faith-based organizations to play a constructive role remains great and often not utilized enough. The pandemic and the common struggle that we face has pointed out the common values of compassion and solidarity that all religion sustain. In this spirit, I'm convinced that our exchanges through a series of webinars in the next weeks will allow us to address some of the most pressing issues reinforcing the broader partnership between religious actors and policy makers. It represents the beginning of a fruitful exchange which could materialize in a strong partnership, in particular with regard to important topics such as ethic and anti-corruption, social justice and good governance, environmental and gender justice. We at CAICID believe that any approach to social cohesion and peace building in order to be effective must represent, sorry, must respect difference and support inclusive and sustained dialogue through multi-stakeholder partnerships. CAICID sees a considerable potential of functioning dialogue platforms composed of representatives of different religious traditions, which can be a mechanism of coordination in response to emerging issues of local communities. CAICID has established and supports the functioning of interreligious platforms in the Arab region, the Central African Republic, Myanmar, and Nigeria. Those platforms serve to combat growing intolerance and foster cooperation through the establishment of dialogue spaces, capacity building, and support of local initiatives. 
In addition to our work in the field, CAICID also works to strengthen the links between research, policy, and practice in order to enhance the process of learning, educating, and networking on interreligious dialogue for peace and reconciliation, thus con contributing to the SDG agenda, especially SDG 16. We also offer online courses on interreligious dialogue and the relevance of interreligious dialogue in the context of Agenda 2030, and invite you to visit our website should you be interested to follow the online content we offer. CAICID works with esteemed partner organizations, faith-based organizations, NGOs, government, and intergovernmental organizations, many of which are entities of the United Nations, such as UNDP, United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, UNESCO, UN Office, UN Office on Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect, and others. We are proud to have served as co-chair of the Advisory Council to the UN Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development, composed of 17 UN entities, including, including UNODC, and now to be a lead member of the Advisory Council, focusing on providing inputs and spaces for dialogue on faith-based organization role in supporting the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, and specifically on the SDG 16, fostering peace and inclusive societies for sustainable development. In the context of crime prevention, faith-based faith -based organizations and religious leaders active on grassroots level showed their indisputed commitment and motivation to go extra mile, to do more than might be expected due to their commitment. Their day-to-day -day presence in the community enables a trusted and frank dialogue with juveniles, substance abusers, or with inmates returning to their communities. The ability to be a bridge from the neighborhood to the larger community and state institution position them as a key resource for, for crime prevention, restorative justice, and victim assistance, as well as good governance. Dialogue is at the heart of the CAICID's work and look forward, and I look forward today to hearing from policymakers and religious actors about their experiences from the field. I firmly believe that meetings like the one today can help us increase knowledge about the great work being done by FBOs around the world and identify possibilities of working together for a common cause towards just and peaceful societies. I hope that today's exchange will enable us to progress in our common journey of collaboration with, which could result in concrete FBOs recommendation to be presented to the United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. I would like to conclude by saying, through our multi-religious and cross-sectoral partnerships, we can have a sustainable impact and we can help amplify the voices of religious actors and bring them to the center of the global stage. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. A very, very uh, strong statement to get us started. Very grateful you're here and a uh, very impressive roster of work that you are uh, taking part in through uh, KISID. Thank you very much. Very happy that uh, Jean-Luc uh, Lemahieu is with us. Uh, he was to have been our uh, lead off speaker. Uh, he, there were little technical difficulties, but uh, uh, without uh, Further ado, I'd like to bring on the Director of Policy Analysis and Public Affairs of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Uh, please welcome Jean-Luc Lemahieu. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody can hear me loud and clear. Very from good. Vienna. Fantastic. Very good. Uh, listen, I mean, first of all, it's so nice to see so many friends around the table again. It's a real pleasure to be um, with you, and it's a real pleasure to speak after Ambassador Abbasete, who uh, again has set uh, the, the, the paradigm, has created I mean, the platform on uh, which we, indeed we can collaborate together. Um, 
I had prepared, I mean, a very long speech, um, but I have to say that um, with the time I have lost already in trying to get connected to you, and uh, um, thanks, uh, uh, Ginny Kagawa, to, uh, to have succeeded in getting me on, on this. Uh, so I will try to shorten and be a bit more brief. I mean, evidently, uh, it, those are very unusual times in which we live today. Um, it is um, um, a, a, a world which is under strain. Uh, businesses, employees are struggling. Ordinary life is for many simply on the halt. I've seen some of my friends, I mean, collecting large beards over those uh, weeks in isolation as well. So uh, things are just not necessarily regular and normal. Um, it is as well a time where we see an interesting discussion popping up, which is very relevant, I mean, to what we stand for in this coalition for faith-based organizations and a discussion about the value of human lives versus the economic value how to protect humanity, how to protect health systems, how to protect our societies, but as well how to protect the economies. Um, how can we prevent both the worst case health scenario and in the same breath, the economic scenario, which doesn't look very positive. Um, it is a world which in many ways is unprecedented. Um, but then again, um, this exposure of the fragility of the current globalized order um, gives us opportunities I mean, to assess on what we are undertaking as a humanity altogether. Um, we have spoken about uh, the uh, um, uh, excellent work being done by the coalition so far. I mean, I uh, uh, um, am definitely very recognizant, I mean, for the event in San Francisco as well. Uh, commemorating the 75 years of the um, um, Charter of the United Nations, a charter which eventually is even today, within this moment of crisis, uh, even more relevant than ever before. Um, indeed, I mean, the multilateralism, as we um, have known it for many decades, is at this moment a multilateralism which is very much again under strain. And one of the lessons which we have to learn from this current crisis with regard to COVID-19 is that um, we need to be careful not to circle the bandwagons again and uh, become exclusive of all those who do not fit the definition of what we would say our in-group. We need to be careful, I mean, that we don't close the borders as is already happening today in a very physical manner. Um, but to understand I mean, that if you want to defeat this virus, that we cannot have it still continuing somewhere on the globe and assuming that we can just, uh, with the bandwagons circled, avoid to have it um, uh, controlling our lives in the future. Um, so we need to rise as a one community, as one love against the greed, against the egoism of an in-group, and against the cruelty and evil of nature. Um, in this context, I think that the work you are doing within this coalition and the webinars which you are putting forward will be very, very helpful in bringing us together. Um, I do have, as you might have known, I mean, for those who are following a bit on what UNODC is entertaining uh, during this COVID crisis, I do have 10 points which I would like to share with you. I mean, it's 10 elements which we see within this crime and in criminality and justice um, moving forward, evolving, and we try to keep a finger on the pulse. But I would like to share with you a little bit how the situation is altering and perhaps that might as well help you when you uh, work on the uh, webinars to come. The first point which we witnessed so far is that there is a move from street crime to domestic crime. I mean, no surprise, I mean, with the lockdown, uh, with the uh, uh, big rise, stay at home, the restrictions which we witness in some countries, uh, that has curtailed the opportunities for crime in public spaces. But one should not forget that this has increased the risk in the domestic sphere, especially for women and children. Uh, you might recall, I must have uh, mentioned that figure earlier before, when it uh, comes to homicide, 
uh, yes, clearly at a global level, 81% of the homicide victims um, are uh, male. But when it comes to intimate um, partner homicide, then women and girls represent 82% of the victims. So with home being the most dangerous place for women, the lockdown measures, as we witness, put women at a higher risk of violence. And that is definitely one of the elements which we're looking at very, very clearly. Um, the second element is the new priorities and challenges for law enforcement. I mean, many of our law enforcement colleagues have been asked I mean, to alter certain uh, uh, attentions towards the lockdown conditions, enforcing the lockdown conditions to attend the emergencies. They might even be uh, more exposed to the coronavirus because of this framework. But that has as well effects with regard to uh, um, the uh, proactive enforcement, which we often see deployed in normal circumstances, which are not, I mean, at this moment, um, taken, um, how would you say it, given the same importance as it was before. Um, so if you see changes in the criminal statistics, we should give it an interpretation within the context as well of the COVID-19 lens. The third element, and it's an element which is already felt, but which will even be more felt within the post-pandemic situation, is unemployment, economic strain, and how that will affect, indeed, the crime situation. Um, economic difficulties for legitimate business and a sharp spike in unemployment might precipitate a rise in acquisitive and profit-oriented crime in countries where economic and social safety nets are insufficient to ensure the livelihoods. We could eventually see, and we have uh, sporadically already witnessed that, some looting and riots possibly in those areas where the population is especially desperate in aiming to fulfill their basic livelihood needs. The fourth element is an increase of profiteering by organized crime. The demand for new products and services in an environment of tight controls on movement and markets will produce other opportunities for organized crime. And evidently, what comes to mind is the falsified medical products, which have increased dramatically. Now, that was a phenomenon largely in the past to be found within developing countries. But with the COVID-19, we still see, I mean, that that market has expanded and has become very profitable as well in other countries. Wildlife crime falls under the same category. I mean, if you consider that in the past uh, you had hordes of tourists and their guides uh, providing a presence in game reserves, which is much larger than that can be provided by the rangers, the protective rangers alone. I mean, not having those uh, uh, tourists and not having those guides around gives ample space, I mean, for criminals uh, to increase wildlife trafficking. The fifth element is circumventing border controls. Now, um, strangely to say, but if you have stronger border controls, then evidently the risk goes up, but as well the profitability goes up. So you see that um, uh, in a certain sense, uh, people are ready, I mean, to take more risks. You have that in uh, the container traffic, I mean, where uh, you see shipments on drugs, I mean, becoming much bigger than they were before because the land borders are closed down. So, for example, when it comes to cross-border heroin trafficking, which is very much focused on land border crossing, we can see already in retail markets in uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia sh some shortages, uh, whereas cocaine trafficking which is more maritime, I mean, moves forward in uh, larger um, uh, volumes. Sixth, opportunistic cybercrime. Uh, we all have heard about that in the news and media, very much so, uh, but people are spending a lot more time on, online uh, during lockdown. So, I mean, the, the opportunity there has increased, I mean, dramatically uh, in very negative manners uh, as well uh, the forms of cybercrime that affect women and children and girls, this proportionality is something which is of a major concern in this category. Seven, corruption and misallocation of public resources. We are seeing out, I mean, and for all good reasons, 
uh, emergency uh, measures, I mean, uh, economically and health-wise, I mean, a large amount of public resources becoming available. But can we guarantee that those resources will indeed uh, come to those who are really in need of those resources? How can we avoid corruption? How can we ensure that uh, the medical equipment that supplies uh, will arrive where they really need it? Eight, and uh, Michael, um, I thank you for referring indeed on something which connects many of us, is the work within prisons and detention centers. Um, we have definitely learned a lot about the uh, fact that uh, in over half, 58% of countries worldwide, even before COVID, uh, prisons were working well above their official capacities. Over one quarter, 28%, are running above 150% of their capacity in prisons. So just imagine, I mean, what a situation this gives, not only on the health situation, but for many of those prisoners not being in touch anymore with their families, I mean, during the lockdown. Uh, how many of them rely for medical and health and as well uh, uh, just uh, nurture on uh, the support of their families. So a, a terrible situation which we need definitely to look into. Nine, and before last one, is the loss of liberties, the limitations and restrictions to civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights um, posed by the emergency measures may have a long-term impact, which we need to look at, uh, especially when it comes to human rights. And then uh, finally, number 10, uh, the battle for legitimacy uh, between government and non-state actors. Um, we have already seen that especially uh, in highly stressed areas where you do have little governance available, there is a competition for scarce resources ongoing. And the public discontent with local and national governments, if they cannot deliver what the population is expecting in those emergency situations, is being abused uh, by others, by third groups, I mean, be they criminal, be they indeed uh, those more radical groups uh, which use an anti-government narrative to radicalize and to recruit. So, um, in conclusion, we can say that in uh, normal days, this assessment of the current situation, which I just gave to you, uh, would have been submitted for an discussion at the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, uh, which, as you know, is the main policy-making body of the United Nations addressing crime prevention and criminal justice. Regretfully, the meeting had to find place this month. Uh, it is not. It has been postponed. But uh, we are very happy then to have this initiative on the webinars so that we at least, I mean, can uh, continue our discussions among ourselves. Um, so a gratitude to the coalition of field-based organizations for this series of webinars. And I hope that the above assessments on the crime situation, still evolving, will help you in guiding your discussions. Through crisis comes also new opportunities and perhaps a chance to set things straight, to come to a new social contract, a new social compact. Um, we welcome your thoughts. Uh, we are looking forward to, I mean, to see how we can continue our, co our collaboration and joint efforts to achieving the sustainable development with the ultimate aim for a more just and safer world, or as Ambassador Alacerti already said, SDG 16, and that is indeed the core of our work. Many thanks for your kind attention and for sharing later on your messages all with us here together. Thank you very much. Over to you again. Well, thank you very much indeed for an extremely uh, well-informed uh, and a very useful outline of critical issues at this time uh, that I think are, are benefit. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a good list of work that needs to be done and we hope that the coalition can be helpful. We, we had planned, I think uh, we had discussed with you to be present in Kyoto and are looking forward to any reschedule of that, that uh, we can go forward with a plan for an ancillary meeting. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Jean-Luc uh, Lamieux. And uh, our next speaker, I'm very happy that Dr. Azakaram is here. She is currently 
uh, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace, one of the world's uh, most distinguished and well-known interfaith organizations. She had put in quite a few years as the coordinator of the Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development, well-known at the UN and throughout the world. So we're very, very, very proud that uh, Dr. Karam had time to be with us this morning. You have the floor, Dr. Aza Karam. Um, thank you very much. I sincerely hope you can all hear me. I wanted to specially thank uh, Dr. Thomas Wolf, Walsh and the Universal Peace Federation and, and, and Michael and all the colleagues online for the opportunity actually to be with you. Um, I've already learned quite a bit listening to um, Jean-Luc and Ambassador Albacete and I think it's, um, it's an honor for Religions for Peace to be amongst you. Um, for those who may not know, Religions for Peace is celebrating 50 years of its existence this year and it's, uh, it's an interesting coincidence that it happens at this time of, of basically uh, what is a global uh, crisis. So there's plenty to contribute and plenty to learn at the same time. Um, we like to uh, describe ourselves as the United Nations of Religions. Um, the composition of Religions for Peace is all the religious institutions in the world being represented. So whereas in the UN you have all the governments of the world represented in this place, we have our, our religious institutions around the world represented and forming our governing board and um, council. We also have presence in country. We have 90 interreligious councils. Each interreligious council is a legally registered platform which has the religious institutions and communities of that particular country um, represented on it. And we have six regional interreligious councils. That's the architecture of religions for peace. We've um, we think it's, it's interesting that at the same time that we uh, established a, um, agreed to convene and were able to convene about 250 religious leaders from around the world to come up with a, a new strategic plan for the organization from 2020 to 2025. The process of coming up with the strategic plan in and of itself I think was extraordinarily unique in the sense that you don't usually have a whole bunch of religious leaders from all over the world and decide together on what it is that they want to do and identifies their priorities. The incredibly good news apart from the process is that the strategic plan is fully in alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. So uh, peace and security, education, environmental stewardship, um, gender equality are all aspects of our strategic planning agenda. So, and this is the first time I think in, in our history of interreligious existence and collaboration that the religious leadership of the institutions actually comes together around a common agenda that has gender equality uh, as one of its main tenets. So that in and of itself is historic. Um, what we've learned, and this goes to the point about, especially during the COVID crisis, with what uh, Jean-Luc was mentioning about the social contract um, and the social compact, is that this is being renegotiated as we speak. This is fundamentally what COVID is challenged and is challenging the religious communities to and with. The, the very nature of worship religious worship, which is the, the basic pillar of religious institutions, is being renegotiated now because the opportunities to the whole social distancing, which is the way to stay, to stay safe and literally to save lives, requires that the worship praxis itself is redefined and reimagined. Um, and that in, in the re-envisioning of the worship of the, which religious institutions are based on is a re-envisioning of the social contract as well. Part of that redesign, if you will, of the social contract is what is happening today with the Interreligious Councils of Religions for Peace, which is what prompted us to set up a multi-religious humanitarian support fund. Because we realized that even though four out of the top 10 humanitarian responders, NGOs in the world are actually faith-based, four out of the top 10 humanitarian responders in the world are faith-based, we realized that they don't necessarily work together. In fact, what very often happens is every single institution decides to go into full gear to respond as first responders in humanitarian crises, but they respond 
within their own institution as their own organization, usually with their primary target audience being their own community. So we felt that this was something that had to be supported, that not just, it's not good enough that religious organizations are the first responders, which by the way means that they play a critical role in renegotiating the social contract at that moment in time and going forward, but that they have to work together. That there is an, an, a necessity, a call, an urgency to ensuring that particularly during moments of humanitarian crises, religious organizations and institutions can come together to serve everyone. And that is the premise on which, on which we based the Multi-Religious Humanitarian Support Fund. Now, this fund is minimal compared to the funds made available by the United Nations um, system. But it is, the intentionality of it is absolutely unique. Um, and it's that deliberate, uh, purposeful uh, engineering and support and facilitation for the opportunity of religions and religious institutions in particular to collaborate during moments of humanitarian crises because 99.9% .9 of their work is about social services. So not so much dialogue, but diapraxis. In other words, bringing the religious communities and facilitating that they are serving their communities, everything from spiritual counseling and care, all the way to actual delivery of medicines, food, water, um, restructuring the, uh, the health facilities that are required, even in New York City, even in New York City, which is supposed to be uh, one of the financial centers of the world, but even in New York City, we have a faith-based organization that set up camp, in other words, public health facility in the heart of the city in um, in the Central Park. In Geneva, we have another faith-based organization that's feeding thousands of people. Um, that is the level to which we have to come to terms with the fact that religious institutions are not doing work, they're not talking with one another, they're actually serving communities. And that's why it's absolutely critical, I think, for us to, to be deliberate and intentional about supporting them in collaborating and working together in that act of service or these series of acts of services that they're providing. Um, we, I, I think I heard uh, Jean-Luc mention the, uh, the, the singularity of increasing levels of domestic violence uh, given the lockdown. That's one of the areas in which our inter, international women's network and the international youth networks are actually very, very busy right now. They're collecting some basic data about how many households have women who are endangered. Um, as a result of the increasing levels of domestic violence, they're providing spiritual um, care for some of these women. And they're also organizing alternative places to house some of these women and to transport them there where they can in the midst of this particular crisis. So you can see that the level of service is correspondent to the level of need and it goes way beyond talking. It goes way beyond talking. It is about serving communities in the moment of greatest need. Um, in terms of the dynamic of uh, crime and crime prevention, we have two simultaneous events that we're seeing unfold. On the one hand, we're seeing some of the religious extremist groups, believe it or not, transform some of their energy into social services. They're actually looking after communities. They're delivering medicine and health and, um, and, and food. Um, it's an opportunity. They, they have to. They're in the middle of it. Many of them are not just in the business of, uh, of laundering money and, and, uh, and bombs. They're actually in the business also right now of actually delivering for their communities and services, which is a deep, deep irony and a very serious issue because they get to be seen like many of these other groups as, as saviors in this space. And so at the same time that they're actually perpetuating atrocities, they're also saviors for some of the communities. That, that has to be paid particular attention to. And what's better than religious communities and institutions who are well-established to be able to mediate that space, to be able to, to translate some of this information and knowledge to distinguished organizations like UN ODC and others, but to be able to also address and assess the impact of that in the long run. Um, we also obviously have the other opposite phenomenon, which is where some of these extremist groups have found it fair game and fair play to start ramping up their violence in their communities. Um, and it, it therefore makes it even more problematic to have some of these communities held hostage to them. So that particular problematic is one in which not only governments, not only security services, but very much religious actors and organizations have to be very deliberate 
about at least being aware of and at most being able to serve in those spaces and serve together across the religious denominations because it's not good enough to have the Catholics work with the Catholics and the Protestants work with the Protestants and the Muslims work with the Muslims. This is a space in which all have to work together because it's a humanitarian, it's an, a dimension of the humanitarian crisis that's very much there. So those are some of the things that we're observing as a result of COVID. Those are some of the areas of service that we are trying to be relevant and valued uh, participants in. And for all of this, we have set up a multi-religious humanitarian support fund in which we invite your contributions to. Um, we, we very much hope that we'll be able to provide that kind of support on a systematic basis. Our, our main belief system, if you will, in Religions for Peace is this. And this, is, this has come and crystallized with the COVID crises. That if religious communities, through the religious institutions in particular, are able to come together and serve in this moment of humanitarian crises, then they are also able very much, there's no barrier thereafter, when the humanitarian crises, the height of it is superseded because nothing's gonna go back to normal, but we're talking about different levels of crises. But if these religious institutions and organizations can come together and serve all in the moments of crises like this, then they are also the best capable and best able to deliver on a peace writ large for their communities when the height of the crises is transcended. If you can serve well now, together as religious institutions in a multi-religious capacity with your civic enterprise and your government, if you can serve now well, you can serve afterwards as the genuine agents of peace going forward. That is the belief system of Religions for Peace. And for that purpose, we set up the Multi-Religious Humanitarian Support Fund. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Azakar. Maybe I, I want to sit in on your classes when you're uh, teaching. I don't know how you have time to teach, but uh, really uh, brilliant and uh, inspiring. Thank you for sharing a bit about the incredible work of Religions for Peace and about this fund and giving us some uh, broad visionary concepts of re-envisioning the social compact. Uh, these are really excellent food for further thought and discussion, but also bringing it very much down, down to the grassroots with not just dialogue, which is extremely important, but this diapraxis concept. So thank you for bringing a great value to this, this webinar. Uh, but I'd li I like to move on to our, our next speaker. Uh, uh, very, very happy that uh, Ms. Uh, Saskia Chelikins has joined us. She has recently come on uh, to the position of coordinator of the Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development, the United Nations Interagency uh, Task Force. It has been referred to by several of our speakers thus far this morning, very, very important development that goes back, I think, to around 2010. And our just previous speaker, uh, Dr. Azakaram, played a key role as coordinator for many years. But uh, without further ado and with pleasure, I welcome Ms. Saskia Shelikin. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas Wells, and uh, thank you uh, to all the previous speakers. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this uh, inaugural event, uh, kicking off this important webinar series, and, and greetings to all participants online. Um, I uh, would first like to, uh, to, to say that as the United Nations Interagency Task Force on uh, Religion and Sustainable Development, but also in my capacity as the Culture Advisor at UNFPA, we greatly welcome opportunities like these for us at the United Nations uh, to connect with multi-faith and interfaith initiatives and coalition, coalitions uh, like yours. And we really value these uh, kind of initiatives focusing on faith-based engagement in international as well as intergovernmental dialogue and cooperation. Um, I was asked by the co-organizers to share a little bit about what the U UN Interagency Task Force on uh, Religion and Sustainable uh, Development is, and, and uh, then I will also share some reflections, uh, maybe more related to the UNFPA mandate, but also to the current COVID crisis, and hopefully uh, be able to bring some, some reflections and suggestions for the particular focus around crime prevention and criminal justice uh, and the work of the coalition. 
Um, so maybe first on the interagency task force uh, on religion and sustainable development, uh, for short IATF. It currently counts uh, 25 UN system entities as members, each participating at different levels uh, of intensity, who come together to, to share information and knowledge about their engagement with faith-based uh, and religious actors, and also share how uh, religious religion intersects with the respective organizations' strategic objectives and mandates. Um, as a task force, we also engage in capacity building activities and the development of system-wide guidance for the UN and oversight regarding our engagement with uh, faith-based uh, actors. And I'm, of course, very pleased that UNAID o ODC is also uh, an active member of this task force. Uh, collectively, the members cover the full spectrum of the UN pillars, uh, sustainable development, peace and security, and human rights, as well as humanitarian assistance. Uh, the task force was uh, established, as you mentioned, uh, in, uh, Thomas, in 2010, as part of the UN uh, Development Group, which currently is, uh, is called the UN Sustainable Development Group, at the behest of, uh, at the time, eight UN principles, including UNFPA, as well as uh, the then uh, World Bank President. And over the past years and since its inception, the task force was chaired by and convened by UNFPA as a pioneer agency within the UN system uh, that was actively seeking the engagement of faith-based organizations and partners under the uh, extremely impressive leadership of my predecessor, Professor Aza Karam, who you all just heard. Um, and as of this year, uh, the arrangement for convening the task force has expanded and uh, is now also including the Office of the Secretary General's Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, as well as the UN Alliance of Civilizations, with whom we, uh, from, from 2020 onward, have a rotational convening arrangement in place for the coming three years. Um, and this has been really encouraging, I would say, to note that there is an increased interest amongst the ever-growing number of members of the interagency task force to also take on coordination and leadership roles within the task force and with our engagement with faith-based organizations and networks. And I think this really speaks to, uh, on, on the UN system side, an ever-growing awareness of the importance of engaging with FBOs and religious leaders in advancing the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as our overarching framework and global blueprint to achieve just, inclusive and sustainable uh, societies and the future for, for all, for people and for planet. So uh, this interest and recognition has also uh, translated uh, over time in undertaking an increasing number of uh, joint activities by the task force. And that includes uh, the organization of things like policy roundtables, workshops, seminars, joint initiatives around uh, key UN intergovernmental events, etc. Uh, as well as the establishment of the Multi-Faith Advisory Council, uh, which was also referred to by Ambassador uh, Albacetti uh, before. So uh, this uh, Multi-Faith Advisory Council consists of a collection of uh, the UN system's uh, faith-based partners, uh, reflecting the diversity of religions, regions, and thematic areas that mirror the UN's broad mandate. The Multi-Faith Advisory Council provides uh, strategic advice and supports the task force in particular uh, in engaging in human rights-based uh, policy advocacy and outreach. And it supports the UN system's engagement in a broader set of faith-based entities uh, and enhances its focus and, and knowledge around religious literacy, representation, and dynamics that are relevant to the UN's work. Uh, the Advisory Council brings together um, high-level representatives of 40 faith-based and faith-inspired uh, organizations and networks and is co-chaired on a rotational basis by four entities that also reflect the diversity of uh, religions. And uh, uh, KAISIT uh, is, for instance, one of the members, as is uh, Religions for Peace. 
um, and the council, uh, just to say, uh, to, to conclude on this point of the Motivate Advisory Council, it started as a, as a pilot in 2018 and it has recently formalized its terms of reference and for uh, its first term it has agreed to focus on some key teams which are all uh, connected and relevant to the 2030 agenda. And uh, they include issues like environment, migration, gender justice, also financing for development, uh, peace and security and, and health. Um, so that's just to give you a little bit of a background on the interagency task force and the multi-faith advisory council that is connected to it. Uh, maybe if you allow me to say a little bit about UNFPA, I'm not sure to what extent the audience uh, that is connecting is familiar with UNFPA. Uh, the UN Population Fund, it's the leading UN entity for delivering a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every birth is safe, and every young person can achieve its full potential. And in working on, on issues of sexual reproductive health, gender equality, women and girls empowerment, um, addressing gender-based violence, um, ensuring that harmful practices are ended like female genital mutilation, child marriage, but also in supporting governments in data collection, particularly population data such as censuses, etc. We, we work very closely uh, with civil society organizations in general, uh, but including in that space very much so also with faith-based organizations as well as with religious leaders and traditional leaders. Uh, and as we work on some of these most sensitive and intimate spheres of human existence, we are very keenly aware that our effectiveness as a UN agency depends on the imp for an important part on our ability to understand these cultural dynamics uh, that communities face uh, on, the, on the ground. And that requires on our part listening, engaging in dialogue and sharing knowledge uh, with community groups and influential uh, individuals, including religious leaders, before we uh, move jointly ahead and plan activities um, on the ground. And, uh, and uh, of course, it also entails identifying what is the positive and the common commonality that we have together, uh, as well as challenging cultural values and assets uh, and expressions of power structures. So uh, the decades of UNFPA experience in the, with the faith-based sector and very much also uh, thanking uh, Aza, uh, Dr. Aza Karam for her in incredible leadership on that front have gone into building, nurturing partnerships, establishing principles of engagement and the development and operationalization of strategies at national and regional and global levels and have helped us to, to support programs that we have seen, uh, you know, uh, reach the most vulnerable and marginalized communities precisely of, uh, because of these partnerships that we have established with FBOs. Um, so that's just a little bit about uh, the UNFPA background and maybe now in, in, in wrapping up um, and just uh, also a few reflections on the, on the team at hand and the work of this particular coalition. Um, I. Uh, I thought to, to also connect more to the, to the team and of course talking about the current uh, context, we cannot uh, avoid talking about the global COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I think as, as other speakers have said that having you know, to face the pandemic uh, has also further reinforced um, our engagement as UN with, uh, with religious leaders and FBOs and really seen and, and recognized their role, the major role that they play in saving lives and, and reducing suffering. Um, and, and they, uh, faith-based organizations and religious leaders are really recognized as one of people's primary sources of support, comfort, guidance, and, and of course, also recognizing, as uh, Dr. Karam also pointed out, that you know they're very key to the delivery of direct uh, social and health services to the communities that they serve. Um, we think that also uh, in this context, religious leaders are, are seen and, and are very critical uh, in their important role in sharing in evidence-based information to protect their own members as well as the wider communities. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, and I think many of you will agree to this, the, 
them them playing this role of information uh, sharers is sometimes also better accepted by the communities uh, that might distrust governments or might distrust other uh, other stakeholders in this space. Um, and of course, uh, the pastoral and spiritual support that is offered by religious uh, leaders and institutions uh, are, are also very critical in this time of need. Um, so maybe building on that uh, recognition and just to give you a, a little bit more on what we have also been uh, engaging um, on as a UN interagency task force and UN entities in this space, uh, just to let you know that the interagency task force put out a joint statement in the context of COVID-19 uh, that received the endorsement of the entire multi-faith advisory council. Um, I also would like to point to the World Health Organization's guidance on engaging with faith-based organizations in addressing the pandemic. And then there are multiple initiatives with other UN entities and faith-based partners uh, in this space at the moment. And uh, they're all extremely critical and welcomed. And additionally, the UN Sustainable Development Group has just recently put out a guiding framework for all our resident coordinators on the ground and the UN country teams, uh, specifically focusing on the socioeconomic impact and recovery, and in particular, uh, in, in that context, the role of faith-based organizations and religious leaders is again recognized, uh, and particularly in the context of resilience building, social protection, and social cohesion at the community level. Uh, this just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of uh, the faith-based engagement on, uh, on the UN's part with regards to COVID. And it's obviously uh, beyond that, just a very, very brief snapshot. Uh, and I can't really do justice to all the broad efforts uh, that so many entities are at the moment engaged in, but also beyond that engaged in, in the context of their day-to-day uh, -day mandates. Um, but maybe just to give to to end with a few very short uh, uh, suggestions, perhaps for for uh, ideas to consider as you are kicking off this uh, this coalition's webinar series. Um, I think that uh, um, you know that it was already I think mentioned by some uh, of the speakers before me, but uh, and having worked myself uh, substantially substantially on youth issues over the past number of years. I would really encourage you uh, also to look at the role of the coalition uh, with regards to young people uh, and, and young people in their communities of faith, uh, how to engage them in education about human rights, civic participation and the rule of law, in dialogues about juvenile justice and the provision of support uh, to, the, to the meaningful in reintegration of young people in society. Uh, which ensures respect for their human rights, particularly also given that uh, young people are really at, uh, at uh, um, uh, bearing the brunt uh, of the socioeconomic uh, implications that the COVID-19 crisis uh, is showing, but also more so with one in, in every four young people uh, in the world being affected by either armed conflict or organized crime, and many more living in, uh, in situations of uh, fragility. So investing in young people, uh, obviously, uh, I think it speaks for itself, can prevent societal costs, but also really support, um, you know, the, the opportunities to reap the benefits for generations to come and really put us on a path of sustainable development and peace. Um, I also very much welcome the mention by Jean-Luc of, of uh, you know, the focus on domestic violence. It's very critical to the UNFPA uh, core mandate and, and really trying to, uh, as an organization, also um, address a lot of our efforts to, to, uh, to ensure that there is a a sufficient response on the ground in communities um, by offering services, by setting up hotlines, etc. But again, there I think um, faith-based organizations and religious com uh, communities have a key role to play in 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 uh, supporting these efforts. Um, and I think uh, beyond that, um, this this beyond also the focus of the work that is happening with you and ODC and. Um, and that takes place in Geneva in the context of the UN. It offers, uh, I think, also opportunities uh, for this coalition to think of how it connects its work 
also with, with processes that will be happening in New York in the coming months. In particular, I wanted to highlight the anniversaries of both the Youth Peace and Security Council, Reso Security Council Resolution uh, 2250, which was, uh, is focusing uh, on, on uh, young people's engagement in peace and security efforts and in conflict resolution, in the prevention of conflict and all forms of violence. And simultaneously also the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution uh, on Women, Peace and Security 1325, uh, which are both happening this year and are, are seeing quite a number of, of, of uh, uh, events and, and processes that are unfolding in New York and I, I think offer an opportunity to connect the work of this coalition again also with, with the processes that happen in, um, in, in New York at the UN. Um, I think I'm uh, exceeding my time here, but I also wanted to, uh, to, to let everyone know that unfortunately I will have to leave this meeting due to another prior commitment I already had uh, set for this time. But if anyone has any questions uh, related to the task force, the work of UNFPA, or any of the issues that I uh, mentioned, I would very much like to connect by email uh, later on um, when there is an opportunity for that. Again, and thank you to the organizers and I, I really hope that there are opportunities for us to continue to engage as, as the webinar series uh, will kick off uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Back to you, Thomas. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Saskia Shelikin. Uh, we really uh, learned a lot and you spoke at one point about religious literacy. I think it's mutual that even the faith-based community needs to learn about uh, the work of the interagency task force more widely about UNODC, about Kaiser Religions for Peace. So this is a, a, a very, very wonderful session for uh, learning a lot, uh, myself included, very much so. But we're very grateful, very information packed presentation. We're grateful we understand you had to go to another meeting and uh, also Dr. Karam had to excuse herself. We're, we're sorry for that. Um, our next speaker is uh, none other than uh, Bishop Munib Yunin. He's uh, going to connect with us, I believe, from Jerusalem. He's uh, based there. He is a Palestinian uh, Lutheran uh, bishop, now retired and honorary president of Religions for Peace. And we're very happy that he is with us. And uh, Bishop Yunin, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thomas. And thank you for uh, this initiative. Uh, uh, of course, I greet you for here from Jerusalem, and I'm really happy that uh, that uh, the world is starting to understand the significance of religion and religious leaders. Um, um, because at certain time we felt that we religious leader, we were speaking to ourselves, but the world is not hearing us. I myself have prepared, you know points, theological points. I will not speak on details, but I, from these theological points, there will be some ideas which can be presented to the FBOs and, and others and to the UN. My first point is, uh, Prophet Micah has said, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God? Uh, Prophetic Micah focus on justice and what is legally expected what right individual have as human created in the image of God? Prophet Micah is intertwining justice with the idea of righteous acts. The Old Testament considers justice as the central concept of the Bible. For justice is not only political, it's also religious, it's also political, it, it, it also cons concerns the human being for God wants the good of every human being. The Swiss theologian Karl Barth wrote, God always takes his stand unconditionally and passionately on this side and this side only against the lofty and on behalf of the lowly against those who already enjoy right and privilege and on behalf of those who are denied it and deprived of it. This is God's message to Moses at the burning bush and at the story of Exodus. God hears the cry 
of the oppressed. This is the message of all prophets. You know, the Latin American liberation theologian Guterres has said, God's preferential option for the poor. He refers to trend throughout the Bible of preference given to the well-being of the poor and powerless of society in teaching and commands of God as well as prophets and other righteous people. This preferential option of peace calls us to look to the world from a perspective of the marginalized and the oppressed and work in solidarity for justice. Justice and only justice is the call of God to us and all the world's leaders in social, economic, and political spheres. So religion also must be involved in social, economic, and political spheres for renewal and putting you know, principles and values. My second point would be, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. explained this in this way, that the individual as the children of God, being created by God and saved by the precious blood of the Savior, Jesus Christ on the cross, are equally valued in as much as they are birthed with an inherent dignity that ultimately respect the requisite for the bestowal of just and fair treatment. So from that point of view, the Christian theology understands that universal peace must be established on four pillars, truth, justice, charity, and liberty as the basis for human rights. Any concept of justice and human rights will, first, will therefore include first democratic relationship when humans, when human rule others, cooperation and fellowship with other humans, cooperation with the environment and the responsibility for future generations of humans created in God's image. Feminist theologians have drawn our attention to the alienation of the female experience in religious thought. This is the reason that the image of God gives the source and power of liberation and equality, not only in words, but in church, in religion, and in society. Thus, I call on religious leaders and FBO and communities to present gender justice policies for their constituencies. In Lutheran Federation, we have given our people, you know, you know, gender policies gender justice policies. This is today very crucial in our world. Religion is only for justice and equality. My third point will be the story, there is a story in the Old Testament about King David that he committed adultery with Bathsheba and sent her husband to the forefront in the war to be killed. Prophet Nathan visited King David and gave him an anecdote of a poor man living happily with his sheep, but a powerful man stole the sheep from him. King David got angry and wanted to punish that man. Prophet Nathan told him, you are the one. This teaches us that religious leaders should be prophetic today in our world, should not only speak the, the language for themselves. They should be creative, speak prophetic. They should never be complicit for violation of human rights or justice. They should dare to speak truth to power. They must challenge any crime against humanity. They must challenge corruption, even in religious institutions. Religious leaders must address equal opportunity in our world, in our society. Eradication of poverty. They must 
work together today as general secretary, secretary general of UN, together religious leaders and the society and politicians to, to, to work, you know, to cooperate and stop war, to cooperate for, uh, for fighting the enemy COVID-19. They must speak religious leaders with FBO against extremism, hatred, racism, be it white supremacy, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, Christianophobia, and others. Religious leaders must not be complicit for their own religion. They must speak for every human being, not only their followers. They must address domestic violence and any kind of discrimination or structural discrimination, uh, or, uh, discriminate structures within their own societies, even institutions or churches or mosques or whatever. They must boldly speak on be peace based on justice in all conflict areas, including, as I come from Jerusalem, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. History will never remember only, you know, court religious leaders who want only their own benefits. History will never remember warmongers. It only re remembers creative peacemakers, not talkers. This is the reason I, I will never stop to work for justice until I find in the society, until I find that peace based on justice and reconciliation based on forgiveness are a reality in our world. And we are ready to cooperate as we cooperate with Regions for Peace and KAISID and other initiatives. We are ready to cooperate on all these principles because these principles are not good for one religion. They are good for all of us. And we need today to collaborate for the sake of humanity. This is God's call for us. May God bless you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bishop Yunin. You speak to me always. I hear you as a modern day prophet. You're very uh, dynamic and powerful. And uh, thank you for these words and the call for collaboration and unity at this time. Uh, we're very, very happy that you were able to join us here today from the Holy Land. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Plotzer to offer a few words, and then we do have questions, and uh, we're running a little short on time. Michael? Okay. Uh, I've been taking uh, notes. I'm, I'm hoping that I uh, got the major points of everyone. As we have discussed, we would like to take up some of the uh, points that were made. Some of you made the same point that the, um, the COVID-19 uh, issue, the environmental stewardship was mentioned several times. Gender justice is another issue which I think was uh, talked about uh, by all of you. So I think um, we have enough to start a few uh, future um, webinars. Um, also uh, the prisons uh, were mentioned. So I think uh, we can take care of at least half of Jean-Luc's 10 points. Uh, we'll have at least five five seminars we could organize in the next uh, five months. So I hope you will all join us, those who are listening, as well as our panelists in keeping this thing going. Um, I, I think it's been an enormous success. I thank the bishop especially for giving a spiritual message to us. Um, and Jean-Luc and uh, Ambassador Albacete, thank you for staying. Um, and uh, we look forward to continued collaboration. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think we'll all uh, be now in uh, gallery mode, the panelists, and I, I have a few questions here uh, that have been sent in to coalition uh, fbo at gmail.com, as well as some questions that have been coming up on the on the chat. Um, <clears throat> one of them is has come in about the issue of economic justice and are, raises the question about uh, universal basic income. To what extent 
are issues of justice and uh, crime prevention related to our economic disparities and equality. I think this was referred to uh, indirectly by a number of speakers. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, any one of the panelists who want to just uh, touch on this issue of the specific point was an unconditional universal basic income, but about the relevance of economic inequality to the criminal justice and crime prevention topic. And if anyone cares to... Don't look. Yes, I mean, thank you very much. I mean, it it's really is a very interesting question. And um, um, you, you might have seen uh, or, or those who wouldn't, that in our World Book Report um, of 2016, already a few years back, we made a clear linkage between um, the drug control problematic, which of course is only one of the many crime typologies, and the sustainable development goals in which uh, poverty comes to the fore. In my own practice, I mean, having worked in Myanmar and in Afghanistan, I can tell you that um, there's always that language, le linkage between vulnerability and opportunity, the socioeconomic vulnerability and the criminal opportunity. And in, in, in ways which are um, perhaps not always well understood, um, it's not that um, people who are poor are um, necessarily inclined to, mean, to go on a criminal track. I mean, in Afghanistan, for example, as was the case as well in Myanmar, um, not all uh, poor uh, farmers were opium farmers, uh, and not all opium farmers were poor. Uh, so I think th that really, that complexity is something which we really need to understand. But if you have poverty, and then on top of that, you have criminal opportunity, I mean, let's say uh, at the level of um, um, the local authorities, uh, then yes, you will see that they will entice those who are socioeconomic vulnerable to uh, engage in activities which might not necessarily benefit them in any great ways. I mean, the first farmer with a yacht in the Caribbean is still one which I need to meet. Uh, but the, the first um, uh, warlord with a yacht in the Caribbean, well, there were quite a few of them around. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily uh, uh, enriching or benefiting those uh, um, who are socioeconomic vulnerable in a large manner in any ways. Um, but it gives them a livelihood, it gives them a certain income, it gives them uh, a, a way of, of venturing uh, and overcome indeed the distress in which they find themselves. Um, so the, 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 there's that, that relationship which indeed um, has been clear within our studies uh, and, and it is one of socioeconomic vulnerability often being preyed upon by those who are more the criminal opportunists. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Uh, let me move on to another question. And uh, this one is about an issue of, um, you know, some, some countries are, let's say, liberal democracies with diverse uh, religions and no constitutional uh, religion, let's say. Uh, but the question is, raised as followed by Keith Best of the UK. Uh, what about states based on a, a theistic or religious authority? And are they capable of accepting international norms of justice and jurisdiction of international tribunals such as the International Criminal Court? Anyone want to take that one on? Yes, Ambassador. Thank you, Doctor. I'm not sure if I will give a, a, an accurate an answer to, to this, but my main point is that uh, those kinds of questions about uh, the, the previous one related to uh, universal basic income and the one that you are that you are making now are very timely and very and very wealthy uh, today. I think that those questions uh, need uh, an ethical answer. And for that, I think that the involvement and, and, and the engagement of religious leaders is crucial. Um, um, those religious actors 
uh, I mean, cannot make uh, decisions on those topics, but they can be influential. And I think that we need to hear ethical uh, voices, ethical views. Mm -hmm. the, the, the main challenges, as I said before, are ethical challenges. And once that we have clear understanding from an ethical point of view, I think that it will be easier to, to, to take decisions. Or at least we will have clear guides uh, to, to, to take decisions and to elaborate on, on those thoughts. Um, one of the, I mean, of the key initiatives that the UN Secretary General has taken is the global call for, for a ceasefire in, I mean, in, all the, in all the conflict. That has been joined by many religious leaders. I mean, most of the religious leaders are all along the, 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 the world. I think that's impressive uh, call from the UN Secretary General, very needed, very timely. And one of the voices that have uh, joined uh, that call of the UN Secretary General has been the voice of the, of the Pope, of, of the Pope Francis. And I want to, to cite uh, the, 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 I mean, the statement of the Pope when he said that we all have to, to go beyond the self-centered uh, of our own personal group and national interest. So if we don't transcend our personal interest, our group interest, our national interest, I mean, we will not be able to, to give solution to, to this global challenge because it's actually a global challenge and it is not a personal of, of a group of a national, uh, of a national uh, or a national challenge. So briefly, so we need global answers uh, we need ethical uh, views, ethical guidelines, and um, for that, uh, I think it's important that uh, we hear the voices of, of religious actors. Thank you very much. Yeah, I say something? Yes, please. Something about Bishop, Bishop Unit. Well, I would like to put things in the, in, 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 in the right way. It's not only theocratic countries that they don't follow international law. Yeah. There are also democratic countries in the West who are throwing in the bin all international law. So I think we must, be, we must not have double standard on these issues. We must have, our, I mean, I agree with the ambassador when he says we must ask about the morality of every country and are we ready to listen also to the, to the prophetic voices, not only for religious leaders, who are, who are a trumpet for, for the leadership. Are we ready to, lead, to hear you know, the prophetic leadership which challenges and takes us into a new ethical, you know, un, uh, um, international understanding of issues? I think we need today, maybe together to write, religious leaders and others, a code of conduct for this. Yeah, thank you, Bishop. Uh, moving on to a couple of more of uh, the good questions that come in. Uh, first of all, there's been a lot of chatter and a lot of praise for the panelists. So you've, you've made a good impact and uh, the audience is very appreciative. Uh, and a lot of questions, maybe more than I'll be able to get to. But uh, certainly one of the issues that came up uh, that's been uh, touched on by a number of you is the domestic violence that has accelerated during the time of, of covid crisis. And uh, so the question is out there, A, that this is extremely important. It needs to be more widely uh, understood and uh, people informed and educated about it. Any comment on how the coalition or faith-based organizations in general could help uh, to raise awareness? Bishop Yunin made some very good points about uh, the Lutheran policies on the gender justice and that but to kind of open the floor for a little more discussion on the issue of, the, of domestic violence. Largely, we know, impacts women. Yeah. Michael? Okay, um, as many of you know, uh, we've been very active on the, the, what they call a femicide, the killing of women, because it does get worse. Women who are beaten often end up dead. Um, I think it, we, should in, we should have a webinar on this issue. I think it's very clear that almost every speaker has spoken to the danger of women being uh, beaten and perhaps even killed 
So my suggestion is that, that we take this on as a, an early webinar. Very good. Very good, yeah. Uh, I agree, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vester. Uh, another question came up from uh, uh, Tekla Woldi talking about some, his experience in Africa that uh, some countries have a very large number of political parties and very hard to bring about consensus and collaboration, cooperation. So it's not just that the re religions are kind of difficult to pull together always, but uh, the political party. Any advice for how in countries that may have 20, 30 political parties all seeking some share and very hard to pull together? Not an easy problem to solve, but uh, could faith-based organizations help? Any takers? May I submit that many of those political parties eventually as well are designed across uh, social and religious dividing lines. Yes. So that makes it even more difficult, I mean, to uh, find uh, um, common links apart from hopefully the national benefit. Yeah. Uh, let me let me just uh, squeeze in one more question. This is from uh, Slavomir Redu. He's raising the issue that uh, Dr. Azakaram brought up, you know, of, of a new social compact that even perhaps coming out of this crisis, uh, we are re-envisioning our life together on this planet. Um, and uh, he uses the term of uh, kind of a United Nations ecumenism that brings together interfaith as well as secular entities for a renewed social comment. It's a rather visionary question if anyone wants to talk about going forward from this crisis. And some are wondering, is it a transformative event where we actually will come out at the end with some new realizations that hopefully are, make us better people altogether? Others know we'll simply go back to the status quo. Uh, is there a new social compact coming? Any thoughts? Well, if you want, I can say something on, about that. I can answer or try to answer. I think that, that that's, a, that's a very difficult question. I think that uh, one thing is the will that some groups or some parts of the society have expressed about the, the, the need to change the, our world and to, to build a new world for, for tomorrow. And another thing is the dynamic that we have suspended for the COVID, but we have not broken. So it's suspended and we are resuming it little by little again. So I don't think the dynamic will be essentially different from one day to, to another or from one month to another. For that to happen, I think that we, we need a public intervention, intervention of the, of the, of the I mean, political uh, responsible. And uh, well, just to give you an example, uh, at the European Commission level, the European Union, the European Commission has announced that the, the, the aftermath of the crisis will be a green deal. So that's, that's a very clear intervention of public uh, institutions towards a certain uh, direction, and it can provoke a, a change in, in, in the coming future. But if that public intervention doesn't happen, the changes will not appear uh, suddenly. So we need the, the, the engagement of, uh, of the public institutions. Just I want to refer very, very briefly, just two seconds to speak about Africa. I think that the, quest, the, the challenge in Africa is not necessarily linked to the political situation. There is a social uh, specific uh, context in Africa that makes the, 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 the challenge of the, of, the, of the COVID especially difficult. I mean, there is hunger, there is uh, VIH, there is lack of health system, there is um, corruption at different levels. So uh, I think that the, the impact of the COVID in, in that country is not about numbers, it's not about um, the question of different political parties working at the same time with lack of uh, coordination. It's more rooted in, in, in you know, in, in, in the society, in the, in the, in the whole continent that makes the, the, the situation or the response to COVID much more difficult. And I'm, a, I'm afraid that the impact in the, in the society will be, will be very, very sad. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, there's something, Dr. Dr. Thomas. You, you, know. Um, you know, I'm I'm noticing. Uh, uh, I would say uh, that we need, you know, shifting of gears. We are noticing that there is goodwill that we want to change, and I hope this goodwill is not only momentary. When we are all living in fear and in panic, that we want more to cooperate. But also we are noticing, you know, during this COVID crisis, that there are some remarks, for example, in Europe, they did not cooperate together, the countries. Or we heard some doctors, some countries saying that they want medicine only for themselves. Or we heard some countries saying, we want to test, you know, the vaccination on Africans. So we have to really, if we want to cooperate for the future, we have to go over our neo-colonial you know, approaches and try to see our common humanity and what is our shared well-being of all this humanity, being African or Asian or, or American or Palestinian or Israeli or whatever, or Asian. I think we are not there yet. This is the reason I'm afraid for post-COVID. I'm afraid of it. Unless we religious leaders will be more vocal and politicians will change their gears. Okay, well, I'm sorry, we're gonna to have to conclude on that. I'm gonna ask Michael, any uh, parting comments you'd like to make before I close it out? No, I wish to thank everyone for coming on board and I'm thanking the 133 uh, participants as well as the panel. Um, I think we can do this again in three weeks. Uh, my suggestions are either environment, faith and environment, which was mentioned several times, stewardship, and particularly involvement of youth, which was very important. And um, uh, perhaps we can deal also with the, uh, the issues of gender justice uh, in an early meeting. So I think we have two issues, uh, and I think we could uh, ask for experts, people who would like to participate in this panel. And please, uh, yes, uh, to respond uh, to the, uh, the email that was, was sent out uh, to, to say that you want to continue to receive invitations. I think that's important we keep growing. All right. All the best to everyone. Yeah, well, thank you, Michael. And uh, I just uh, say uh, a ditto to that. Uh, really, uh, you said it well. We're very, very grateful to all the speakers. Uh, Jean-Luc, it was very, very important you were here. We're so glad you took time to be with us. Uh, 90 minutes. I know your time is busy. Ambassador Albacete, uh, Dr. Azakaram, and uh, uh, Ms. Saskia Shelikins, Bishop Munib Yunin. You really were the all star team today. So uh, we will create a recording, we'll send it to you, and uh, we'll follow up with all those who've joined in uh, for this uh, webinar. And thank you for all of your questions, your comments on the, on the chatter chat list. And uh, look forward, we'll be posting our next uh, webinar plan uh, in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank Have a you. great God day. You all. all the best. Peace. Thank you. Thank you.